Chad Michael here. I'm here to talk about five things that contractors can do during this crisis. This crisis being now that it's uh, March 20th, 2020, the coronavirus and COVID-19 pandemic crisis that's currently hitting and devouring our country and the rest of the world. And I know that this is just the beginning of that crisis and the crisis is very, very real. So let's first start by understanding that, you know, I'm 42 years old and I've never in my lifetime experienced all of the closures you know, nationwide that we're seeing right now. It's real. You just have to look at the numbers. It's just math. The reason why they're freaking out is because some of the models have potential deaths in the millions. And so obviously people all over are the, the ones who are taking it seriously are trying to do everything they can to prolong the crisis, essentially, to flatten the curve, to extend the, the amount of uh, hospital visits, essentially, over more time so that they don't happen all at once. Um, all of this that's happening is causing a great deal of stress to everyone in the country, but especially to people in our, our community, our, our industry. Contractors are sort of uh, watching and waiting to see how the dust is going to settle, to see how bad it really is. And I think most industries are really doing the same. And so I want to talk about five different things that you can still do and that you, you should be doing, you, you must do during this crisis. And I know that they're talking about, you know, two weeks, things are going to be shut down. I'm going to go ahead and go on the record with my opinion that it's going to be at least three months. And you, you don't have to believe me on that, you know, um, but I've been very much watching this. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very well informed. I've been studying this for a couple of months now and really watching it coming. And to me, after being in 14 hurricanes or the aftermath of 14 hurricanes, it reminds me a lot of that. It reminds me of watching a hurricane coming in and you know it's coming and you're waiting to see where it's going to hit. And then once it hits, that whole area is sort of shut down for a little while. And that, that is um, devastating when it happens. You know, the restaurants are closed, water's down, power's down. And it's like commerce, at least in that area, sort of stops and everybody goes through the cleanup process to try to get everything back online. But it takes a little while for things to get back up and moving and going and to get back to normal again. But the difference is, is that, one, we have to wait for, it's like we're waiting for a far longer period of time watching this thing come in ashore, if you will. And number two, it's gonna last a lot longer, the devastation. So it's like a slow mo moving hurricane. And then the other part of it is that we don't really know how it's going to end up, but it's going to hit the whole the whole country. So it's not just one little market, one little location. It's hitting the whole country at the same time. So I've never before experienced anything like that. Like I, I very much remember 9-11. I was already running a business at the time, and I remember how everything stopped for a while. Um, I remember the you know the financial crisis, the housing crisis. I've seen a lot over my lifetime. I've been through. I've seen the first Iraq war and the second Iraq war and the Afghanistan. And I've seen a lot in my lifetime, but I've never seen anything uh, coming at our country like this. You can look at the stocks and look at uh, the fact that we've had, you know, some of our worst days over the past week or so than we've ever had uh, since the Great Depression, you know, since uh, Black Monday, you know, like it's bad. It's, it's been as bad or almost as as bad as black money. I'm not a stock expert, but all of these things are indicators. You see the hotel industry, the restaurant industry, and where do you where does that stop? You know, they're talking about in the government um, bailing out the 
workers and bailing out uh, businesses. But but where do you where do you stop with that? And it's just it's going to continue on and on to one industry, at, you know, to another. And so to me, you know, it, and they're talking about 15 days. You know, it's going to last at least two to three months or longer, and then it's going to die down in the summer. Um, you know, as it gets warmer, but then it's going to come back again. So we're going to have to go through this again, and we're not going to have a, a cure for at least a year. And it's probably more like 15 to 18 months until we have a, a vaccine for this novel virus that's that's coming up, that's already here. We're already seeing if you if you follow any of your local news wherever you are. I know we're seeing it here in the Dallas area. I was just in Denver, I saw it in the news there, uh, and different places where hospitals all over the country are being overrun already. They already do not have masks, they don't have proper equipment to keep themselves safe so that they don't get taken off the front lines. So all of this is causing anxiety, and I don't mean to go on and on about, about the problem, and I'm sure you know the media is, it has this thing very, very amped up. I think a lot for a good reason, and so I don't mean to be, you know, spread more fear. That's not the purpose of this video. I've just been giving it a lot of thought, and through all the different uh, crises that I've been through, and also in my own personal life, in my own business um, journey, if you will, and the struggles that I've had, I have very much learned how to be um, not like everyone else. So if you remember, you know, you think of a hurricane and you think of like an aerial view of the freeway when everybody's evacuating out one side and the other side's there's no hardly any traffic on it. You might see like one vehicle. That one vehicle, that's me. Like, I'm not saying that I'm trying to head into where the virus is here, but I want to be different from everyone else. I don't want to look at this like everyone else is looking at it. And so I've given it a lot of thought and I've had to look at this situation as a business owner much like you, you know, as a contractor, uh, an insurance restoration contractor, being worried and having that anxiety and stress about what's to come and how I'm going to survive and, and protect the ones around me and my family and the people that depend on me uh, and how am I going to be able to provide and get through this crisis, right? And I believe that I've come up with five solid pillars of things that I'm absolutely going to have to do. And I wanna share those things with you. Five different ways that contractors can still win through this crisis and five different ways that I believe are gonna be essential to even your business survival through the crisis. And we're gonna cover those now. Here we go. Five things contractors must do to survive and thrive during this crisis. Number one, you must continue. And let me explain. Number one, continue. You've got to continue to work right? You have to continue to operate your business. Let me explain why. If you're an insurance restoration contractor, then honestly, I would submit to you, you're an essential business because, I mean, we're coming into uh, wind and hail season and a lot of active weather all across the country. And so we should expect it to be very active in folks that are experiencing damage to their property to you know homeowners their houses are going to be damaged by storms and businesses and their commercial properties are going to be damaged by storms aren't they and if we're, and that's just storm and hail and wind but what about water fire and all of the other things that are going to continue to to take place i mean there's going to continue to be damage all across the country and so if there's damage to a property those people are still going to need a contractor to make the repairs to the property let's also think about what is our industry it's insurance restoration if there was ever a recession proof industry in this 
country or in this world. It's what we work in. It's insurance. Insurance companies are stronger than just about any other industry out there. They should be the last man standing. I'm not saying they're completely infallible, like they're just like invincible. But I'm just saying if there's ever an industry that you would have to rely on the money being paid for your services, it's going to be insurance. And you're going to have to be concerned about uh, the property owners and them you know, wanting to pocket money more than they might have wanted to before because they may be concerned and scared. So you're going to have to be, you're going to have to watch out for that, right? But other than that, your service is still going to be necessary. If there's a windstorm today and trees start falling through houses and knocking through windows, those people are going to pray that they can contact a contractor to come out and help them with that, that emergency situation right away. They still have the obligation to mitigate damages. And so I want you to understand your service is still essential. So you must still, number one, continue to do what you do. Now, that brings me to number two, though. Allow me to explain and elaborate on number one by giving you number two. And number two is you absolutely, if you are going to continue, like just assuming that you could just continue business as usual, as normal, if you are going to continue doing your job as a contractor, then because of the current environment, given everything that I talked about at the beginning of this video, because of the current environment, you absolutely must adapt. You have to adapt. You've got to find ways to adapt to the current environment. You've got to adapt and adjust to the environment. And so if you are going to continue business as usual, you've got to adapt. Now, a couple things I want to point out. You know, I, I, I've always been a, uh, a takeout person. I always go and at least when I started to get healthy, lost about 100 pounds, I've, I, I like to go and get takeout. And so me not being able to go into the restaurant and eat inside of the restaurant, because now I'm in this, at least in Texas, all the restaurants and dining rooms right now are closed as of yesterday. You can still get takeout right now. Um, but when you go get takeout, to me, it's really no, no change except for there's now going to be a lot more people in the takeout, right? Now, given all of the, the fears about this virus, you know, I was traveling through uh, Arkansas and through Oklahoma just over the past week and in Colorado, and I was still getting my takeout, right? And I noticed as I was going into different restaurants in certain places, they still had the restaurant, you know, the dining room was open, it was still packed like wall to wall. And I noticed when I went to the takeout area to get my, my food, they didn't have any gloves on. You know, I saw people like touching their face and serving me the food, you know, so I, that made me a little nervous, you know, because I'm trying to take precautions. I'm trying to wash my hands and wash all surfaces and anything that I touch. I'm trying not to touch my face, you know, because we could still be healthy, but, but be a carrier of the virus. Like we could get it and not know it and carry it and give it to somebody else. And that's how the spread continues and continues. And they have been saying that younger people don't get it. Now they're saying that that's not true. There's a great uh, percentage of people that are being hospitalized and even killed that are not uh, older and elderly people that you would normally think of, right? Um, so that kind of bothered me, you know, going in and get the takeout. I worried about that. I'm just maybe call me paranoid, right? Um, but then I went into one of my favorite restaurants when I got back to Dallas the other day, and they had already got themselves up to speed. Like they had gloves on, and they had the bags in a certain area, and they said everything's in the bag. I asked for soy sauce, and they're like, everything's in the bag. Like, they made it clear, we're not touching that bag again, you know. So that made me feel a little more comfortable because I could see that the people that were there were taking big-time precautions. And we're just going to see that more and more in order for people to stay open. And so just I, I want you to think about that from a consumer's point of view. Someone like me that is concerned about the virus 
and they see if they go in to do business with someone they can see that no one's doing anything and taking any precautions that's going to make them nervous about going back in there again so if you bring that home to say a roofing contractor after a hailstorm or maybe still following up on last year's hailstorms when you come into that area you know it's it's going to be very difficult for you if you're used to going into those markets and knocking on doors and just striking up a conversation and striking up business that way that's going to be very difficult to do because if, if you show up at a person's house and they're taking all those precautions all day long everywhere they go to not allow any new you know a potential for infection to come into their house and then you come up and knock on their door and and you're out there with your clipboard and even though you're a nice guy and all or, or gal right that that could flip some people out and that could be the difference of you not being able to get business right and so i'm just thinking that if you are going to continue on with your door knocking, if you are going to continue on with your inspections, which I think you should do in trying to build up your pipeline, I think that you should take the precautions. And so what if you were to glove up and even do, you know, wear masks if you can get if you can get your hands on any of these days, but or or do anything to keep the distance from people. If you were to take and have that policy as a company, then to me that could be something that you could actually even market. You know, you could market that. You could you could use that as your uh, advertising these days. Like, look, we're taking all precautions. You could do the emails. Like, I know you're probably getting emails from all these other businesses about these precautions that they're taking. You could do that and advertise the fact. Like, if you're doing Facebook uh, sponsored ads, you could put on there. You know, and maybe show some videos and images of your inspectors and how they are taking the precautions to let people know like look we're continuing business as usual but we're not being irresponsible about it we're being responsible we're an essential business we have to carry on as a restoration contractor to, per to continue to serve our community through this crisis but we want you to know we're doing that responsibly and so I think you need to uh, take precautions and how you run your business obviously if you're in a building like this or if you're in an office wherever you work at I think you should go ahead and set up those policies about how you know follow the CDC or follow you know a, a, a trustworthy advice you know from actual professionals who know what they're talking about uh, right now the CDC is saying gatherings of 10 people or less that number is arbitrary it's 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 obviously an arbitrary number um, but that's the, if you're looking for some kind of advice to follow at least look to the CDC 10 people or less currently March 20th 2020 you know I look for maybe even soon for this building to be closed you know I, I look for the governor here in Texas to maybe follow suit like like some of the other states have already done in California and New York just in the in the past day or so have already issued the stay at home you know uh, orders the directives and so if they were to do that this building is going to close and I won't even be they've already uh, shut this building down to guests and that you can't go in the gym and so I'm already looking for that to happen I'm already looking for the fact that we're all going to have to work from home okay so go ahead and get ready for that and however you're running your business you know now's the time for the everybody to be working from home now going back to that uh, going backwards a little bit to the continue part about this being recession proof the good news is is that the adjusters that you're going to deal with the insurance companies believe me if there's ever any industry already set up for all their people to work virtual and work from home and work mobily, you know, t to telecommute, if you will, it's the insurance adjusters. Those insurance companies have been set up like that for a long time because they're used to still operating after disasters. So that's the good news. You're still going to be able to communicate with adjusters. I look for, I've already heard about, I want you guys to help me too. What are you seeing out there right now? What are you seeing? Where are you at? Please comment below because I want to know from you, what are you seeing from the insurance companies right now? Right now? I've heard stories about um, the adjusters wanting to do their inspections virtually. I don't know how that exactly is going to work even in this environment because I still think that an adjuster can go and do an inspection, right? And I know a lot of you are roofers watching this and doing that the do exterior work and, and most of you, um, especially if you've been watching me, you already know that even if you're doing a roof, you should always inspect every room, closet, and hallway on the inside. 
but I do realize that there's a great uh, percentage of roofers who don't like to do anything on the inside. They don't want to touch it at all on the inside at all. If that's how you're going to you run your business and that's how you're going to continue, you know, I, I don't think that's uh, good because it doesn't add to the complexity of overhead and profit and a lot of other things too. Um, but if that's the way you run your business and that's the way you're going to continue, then great. You don't have anything to worry about. But if you're like me and you have to go in and inspect everything on the inside, then you have to have a proper plan with your client when you go and do the inspections, right? Um, you have to set that up with them and let them know how you plan to take precautions. Are you going to have, you know, gloves? Are you going to have a mask on? Uh, can you do it, you know, when, when no one's, one else is around? Can you take proper steps to sanitize the area? You know, and I want to talk about that too, sanitize the area. You know, if, if you are going to adapt and you're going to, this does not mean changing your business model. I want to point out something very importantly for those of you in the insurance restoration space, and I just want to share my thoughts on this. If you are currently, if you have the idea that you're going to go out there and offer a service to clients of like cleaning up for them and disinfecting and sanitizing and sterilizing the area to protect from the coronavirus and COVID-19, alert, alert, alert. Like that may not be um, as good of an idea as it's cracked up to be, okay? Let me just explain, like, we don't know anything about this, but we know some about this virus, but not enough to be able to go and offer services to protect from. I mean, listen, if you're gonna go and clean the area for someone, that's more like a cleaning service, that's okay, but, but just don't advertise the fact that you're going to eliminate you know, the potential for the virus because so you go in and clean the area and somebody else walks in and coughs and that's all over with. You know, sterilizing it is something different. You can't sterilize it. You know, you, like unless you're in that space and if you're hazmat and if you're properly trained to do that type of work, also you need PPEs, the personal protection equipment. And if you don't have any of that, then don't set out to enter the space at all. But I would just say, you know, you need to follow very carefully uh, the FDA guidelines and um, as well as CDC and, and not just things that you already know. You know, you need to jump into those other things and also look out for the FTC who is currently cracking down on people who are making claims to eliminate, you know, like a property as risk from the virus like that. That's very, very dangerous. And so I, just, I did want to point that out. So I, I don't know, I, I, I've seen other people talk about it and had an idea to go jump out there and provide that service. And it's crossed my mind, but after you know, much thinking of it and really looking into it and thinking of it and thinking of all the ramifications that come from that, I don't think it's a good idea at all. I think it's, it's too much wrought with liability. I mean, technically, you know, if you were to go in and clear any space from anything like asbestos or lead or something like mold, right? Then you would have to, I mean, you would be advised to utilize the, the services of a certified industrial hygienist who could come in and test the air quality and then give you the all clear, right? Like give you a clearance that everything is clear. Well, because we don't know enough about the novel coronavirus, I don't know how anybody could really give you that clearance yet right now. And I, I hey, maybe there's people that can do that. Um, but if you're not one of those people that can do that, then I wouldn't mess around, get in that space, right? All right, now, moving on. So we talk about number, you know, number, number one, continue. Number two, definitely adapt, adjust to the environment. You know, make, and also just to, fo to follow up with that, set up uh, protocols and policies with your staff how you're going to be able to keep things moving, how you're going to be able to keep them accountable. If you don't have a CRM, now's the time to get a CRM so that you can work on your processes and keep everything moving, even though everybody else is not under one roof, so to speak, like people are all spread out. And that happens a lot in this space anyway. So, I mean, I think a lot of you probably were already thinking before this started to happen that you needed better processes, you know, and better, like you, that you need a CRM. Now's the time to get that get that rocking and make that work, right? But number three, and this is very important, right? Like you need to make income. So number two, we hope that you're gonna to continue to make income, right? But number three, 
you, I can guarantee you, like at least 90, 95% or more of you watching this right now has a stack of files of jobs that you've been working on or you're getting ready to work on, you know, that needs to be supplemented. And you know it, right? And so that's what you got to do right now. You need to supplement. You need to get into all of your pending files, your pending jobs, right? You need to get into all of your, you know, even this is, I always say you got to supplement before the build, but let's look at some of our old jobs. Let's go back and now's the time where we got to go back and see if there's anything we might still be able to supplement. You know, if it's something that you supplemented before the build already, and then you went and built it, but you just didn't follow up with the insurance company, but you have documentation where you can go back and really open up another round, let's open up those files, right? So now is the perfect time to catch up on all of your estimate writing. You know, if, you, if you've been putting off Xactimate estimates that you know you've needed to work on, you've been putting off paperwork, you've been putting off you know, getting your uh, photos together or building code research, different things. I know I've been, I've, I've been like that my whole life, you know, where I have estimates that I know I need to write, you know. Now's the time to get in there and catch up on those estimates and supplement because going back to how the insurance companies are, like I told you, they're going to continue on with business as usual. There might be some changes and, and, and adjustments that they, not might, there definitely will be changes and adjustments that the insurance um, companies will have to make and they will make, but they will continue on with business as usual. Mark my word, I'm going on the record and saying that, okay? So let's get our supplements in order. On this note, you know, I'm gonna just tell you, this is, I'm gonna be doing this in my own business but as you know, I've spent 10 years doing virtual supplements and virtual estimate writing for the past three, three and a half years. I changed that to where I only do boots on the ground, inspections, estimates, and supplements because of everything that's going. And, that, and the reason why I've done that, I've done that is because I believe that uh, my inspection is what it takes. You know, like I believe in my inspection. I don't, I have some, so, um, I've had so many problems getting the contractors to give me the right documentation, the right proof, photos, and things like that. So um, that forced me to go out and be sort of a solo practitioner and travel around the country for many years doing the inspections myself, writing the estimates myself, handling the supplements myself, uh, instead of having a big staff of people like I used to have to do that. Um, however, given the current environment, I am going to go ahead for a limited time. I don't know how long I'm going to be doing this. And so I'm going to accept virtual estimate writing, some supplementing and more consulting, virtual consulting. I'm going to do uh, more things virtually. So, you know, I, I have been doing virtual for years and years and years and I know how to do it um, efficiently more than anybody else, I believe. And so, you know, let me just throw that out there. If you need help with step number three on your estimate writing and supplementing, shoot me a message, hit me up. Um, I will help you with that, okay? If I have room, uh, to, I'm not gonna take on work for everyone, but I'm gonna take on some of these and I wanna evaluate, you know, what, what type of uh, projects and how your system's sort of set up before I just take on the work. So I'd like to, I'd like to screen that, but um, I, I can help with that. So, but, but aside from me and what I can do to help or not help, forget about me. Whether you utilize the services of me or someone else to help you with this right here, okay? This is something that's going to be crucial to your survival and to your success over the next two to three months. I believe supplementing, there's never been a better time to jump in hardcore to your supplementing, okay? So number four, moving right along, this is going to be train, okay? Train. This is a lot like number three in the sense that this is something you've probably been putting off for you yourself and for your team getting up to speed on education and information that could help you add to your bottom line to increase your profits, to increase your business, right? Is train. 
This is essential. And this is why a lot of people do go to training events and conferences during the winter months because they, they use that downtime to invest into themselves so they can come back stronger, bigger and badder than ever when the season gets back up and running again. So a lot of you already know what that's like. We're just gonna have to go through another winter period sort of in, in the sense that things are gonna change, things are gonna slow down. Um, there's going to be downtime. There's going to be isolation. There's never been a better time in 2020 with the, the technology at our fingertips, um, you know, with podcasts and YouTube channels and the devices that we have. Oh, hey, we still have Internet. Thank God for that. Right. We still have our electricity. Most of us, if you don't, you know, I mean, I know people are going to be struggling. You know, who knows if that's going to be the case for very much longer. But for right now, most of us, I know I do, thank God, you know, but for the grace of, of God, there go I. But for right now, I still have electricity and I still have the, the ability to invest in myself and better myself and, edu you know, get the education that I constantly have to get to stay ahead of the curve and remain relevant in this industry, right? And so, you know, contractors and your team, your, the, your training is never good enough, I believe. And again, shameless plug, but I gotta throw it out there, I can help with that too. You know, it, I'm gonna be doing a, a live workshop, like these training events that I've been doing all over the country, the 100 Town Tour, I'm gonna be doing some of those virtually. I'm gonna do some virtual training sessions specifically for companies and to be able to work with the owner of a company and his team, no matter where each user is. Hopefully they're not all in one place, but we can set it up to where we have a group community online virtually. And I think that's what you've got to do. You know, whether it's, again, whether that's involving me or not, I think you've got to do that in your environment. I think you need to set up better training. I believe that if you're a restoration contractor, one of the biggest challenges that we have as restoration contractors is the training. Like the ongoing training for sure, which is more of what I'm talking about, but your initial training, like when you hire your sales reps, for example, you bring them on, you know you wish that you would have or are training them better, right? You would have trained or you are training them better. I know most people, that's a pain point for most contractors in the sense that, you know, let's say you go out and you do a magnificent job of you, hire, you do, you know that you'd have to do recruiting. So you hire up a bunch of, you know, a round of new sales reps. You go all in and train them maybe through like a three day training process and you give of yourself everything of yourself. And then there's that turnover rate where some people make it and some people don't. Most don't, and maybe all of them don't make it through that one round. And you find yourself having gone through all of that, and you know that you've got to go back and do it again, but you're like, oh my goodness, I don't know how I could possibly go back and go through that again. And so you don't, right? And you find yourself handling the sales, and you find yourself out on the front line, and you get too involved with things. It's like the fog of war. You're on the front line. You're you're taking calls from clients about colors of shingles and different things and carpet and you don't have the time to go back and start doing interviews again to hire new people. So I think the, the solution to that and the training is to create your own tr internal training course that trains each new rep like for the onboarding process when you hire new reps they go through training right I say you do that one time, but film it and put it into a training course where they're required to go through tests and things like that. Um, it, it's not as hard to set up as you might think, you know, but it, you know, it's, it's, it is very difficult. It's a difficult process. Um, I set up a training course at iescertified.com, if you don't know already. That training course it covers specifically inspections, estimates, and supplements, right? And that's in, in this space, the insurance restoration space. So that's what the IES stands for. But I set it up and it has over 30 hours of video and audio training. And there's, you know, covers multiple different uh, chapters and segments within the chapters. It's very organized and structured. Like you kind of got to go through this part to go to this part. There's tests at the end of each uh, section, if you will. 
and you have to pass it, the test, 100% to move on. Like you can't have anything wrong. You can take it again, but, and then at the, at the end of it, you get a certificate like you're certified. And from the admin side of things, I can see who is doing the work, like who is actually logging in, who, what are they watching, what are they doing. I have the stats and, and the analytics on the back end to be able to see how that's going. And so, you know, I, I just know that was one of the things, the hardest things I've ever done really is to set that up, but one of the most rewarding. And now that I've done it, I feel like I could do it again and again and again much easier and the platform that I use is really plug and play like I didn't have to design the whole platform I I utilized a, a, a platform that was already set up and ready to go where you just you have to make the videos and film them and edit them and upload them in and there's some integration you have to do and some optimization you've got to you know you have to do a lot of writing and write out titles and put labels on things and you have to choose options on a lot of things but once you've done that, think of that. You could now, like if you have a training course where if you go and you interview the sales reps, where I think you could, especially in the current environment, you could even do that virtually now, you know, where you could do virtual interviews. Whereas before that, I would have loved to have done that before, but I think it would have come across as a little too awkward, a little too odd. And now I think it'll fit right into the current environment. So you can actually do virtual interviews, hire people virtually, and when you hire them, you say, okay, listen, you're gonna get an email from the company with your login credentials to the course, go ahead and start the course, and then you have so long that we're gonna give you to complete it, other than that, you take it at your own pace. You, and I would set up actual paid training for them to go through that, like with limits, like basic paid training. Um, I think that'll give you the edge. If you have the ability to do that, I, I would set up some paid training. And then, you know, once you, are com once you complete the training and you graduate, so to speak, from the training, then we'll go ahead and order your business cards and your shirts and things like that and get you going. Like, don't even put them on the roster. Don't get leads going for them or anything until they've completed that training. But think about that. It takes zero energy, time, resources from you, right? So I think you, you should invest in yourself to learn, to get information that can help you be better at your job and everybody on your team to be better, okay? So, so development, like ongoing development, ongoing training, continuing training that can help them over the long run and develop them as they go, but also the initial training. What are you gonna do to solve that pain point? I know what I'm gonna do, I know what I am doing, um, but that's another thing. So I can help you with that, I can help you with the, the online training course at iescertified.com. That's something that you can do and you can do it right now. You're gonna have more time now to do that than ever. Your team's gonna have more time to do that. You can go to insurancerestorationtraining.com, um, contact me through that platform or through here or any of my social media uh, platforms for custom training for you and your you and or your team throughout this period of time. I would love to help you from a distance, virtually, um, with your training to help you get better. Because that's the good news, and that's what brings me to number five. That's the good news with all of this, the, the bright side of this, is that there will be an end to this. It's not like hurricane damage, like I mentioned before, in the sense that hurricane damage comes and devastates infrastructure and power and water and property you know this is not going to damage property like those things like like a disaster like that does and so there's going to be an end to this we're going to get through the end of this we're going to have pain we're going to have loss we're going to have struggle it's going to be real painful in our country i believe but we're going to get through it we're going to come out the other side of it and when we do what's our business going to look like then and so that's like number five Prepare, okay? Like that's crucial. We've got to prepare. What are we going to do when it's over? Okay? And that's, this is, this is where, so people most of the time, myself included, we, we fail to catch up on our supplements, right? We fail to catch up on our training. We fail to, kept up, to, to catch up on our preparation. We, you know, you, fail to plan, you plan to fail. It's so true. 
And I, it's something so freeing for me. It's like taking a load off of my shoulder when I sit down and do a to-do list, for example, right? Then that, you feel like a load comes off your shoulders when you can get all of your worries and anxieties into an actionable to-do list. For me, I feel better when I put things into a to-do list and then I can I sort of put everything in a perspective that way. I love when I set up a new business that I'm totally committed to, that I'm all in with. It's like I can't even breathe, I can't sleep, you know, because I'm constantly um, thinking about the details and the planning of that. You know, a, a, setting up a business plan, setting up a budget, setting up the numbers, right? I think that now is a time like no other to get your preparations in order. Prepare. How, what are you going to do? How are you going to conduct your business when this is all over? And how can all of these things help you for when it's all over? Because I believe if you continue now and if you adapt and you amp up your supplements, right, to beef up your income and you train, invest in yourself and prepare, these five things are going to be what's going to help you through this crisis, help you survive and thrive. And I would also say, you know, if you're going to continue, just throw in one other thing, if you are going to continue to run a business, think of other ways that you can provide services for revenue, right, as a business. Aside from, with the exception of going out and jumping in and trying to disinfect the virus. Like, don't, I don't recommend that part of it. But what are some other things that you can do, that you have the ability to do, to make income that could be of service, that could provide value to your community? And if there are things that you know of or that you can come up with to be able to do that successfully, can you utilize your team? Can you utilize other uh, workers out there who are who have downtime that are not able to go to work because they they work in a restaurant or something like that. You know, who who are the opportunists in all of this? And what can you do? You know, and I would also say, this is something that it's not entirely like we're not entirely sure about this as scientists. It seems like there's a small chance that it might not be true. But it seems like if you have already contracted the virus and you've recovered, it seems like you're going to have, like your body's going to have the immunity now for that virus. Like so, it, you, the chances of you getting it again are very, very low. Like they said that there has been data where people have contracted it a second time, but when they took a second look at that data, it appeared that more than likely it was that they still had it um, or that there was a faulty test the first time. And so my point is, if you've had the virus already and you've recovered, you have an immunity now. So to me, the, the first responders and, and uh, medical care workers that are contracting the virus and they're being taken off the front lines, what they're not mentioning is, is they'll be able to go back in after they recover and then once they do, to me, they don't even need masks, right? Like, I mean, they do, because you have to worry about other things, but, uh, you know, think about that. They can go right in on into the front lines with without having to worry about it anymore. So I think that's something that people are missing here, that they're not talking about. So if you're looking for help and help wanted, you know, think about this, help wanted. Um, if you've already contracted the virus and recovered, we want you. I think these people, you know, so if you're out there and you and you get this and you're recovering from it and you make it through then in which all likelihood you're the majority of us are going to make it through then that's an opportunity that you have you're going to be your value is going to be way greater in the workspace than other than anybody else who hasn't gotten it think about that am i not right on that you know so that's a real gold nugget i hope you made it all the way to the end to catch because to me, I think that nobody's talking about that. If you've contracted and you've recovered, you have an advantage. And so you might be looking for people who have, which you probably don't know anybody yet. Maybe you do, that actually got sick from it because the testing's not up yet. Maybe you do know them, but you, they don't know that they have it. Um, but pretty soon, <laughs> this is gonna be a great, uh, maybe even the majority, like between 40 and 60% of the population, depending on where you're at 
are going to get it. So you're going to know a lot of people that have it, have recovered, and let's. And I pray to God that that anybody you know, your family and friends and people important to you, and anybody really makes it and recovers through this. I, I hope we all can come together like we never have before. I've seen that spirit, you know, like after 9/11, where things were divisive, but then everybody just put aside all their uh, political differences, and we just need to pull together. We need to think of each other, you know, and if you're trying to think of what that service is that you can provide, or if you're helpless, feeling helpless, and you're stressed out, and you feel major anxiety, and you don't really know what to do, in that moment, look for ways to go and help others. You know, like, I drove by a retirement center earlier today, and I could see the signs all up, because I think the part of the new state law here in Texas is that you cannot visit uh, elderly retirement centers or any place where elderly folks are for good reason, and they should do that everywhere anyway. Um, but that's so sad for pe- you know the elderly people that are there. Like they already probably feel isolated, and so I wonder what are things I'm trying to think. You know, what are things that we could do maybe to help people like that? You know, and and maybe contact them. Say what do they need the most of? Um, is it just videos and FaceTime? You know, I don't I don't really know. But I think that when we're when we're really stressed in those times, we need to think about how we can serve other people. I hope, you know, it's not cliche, I mean that. Because I think that's when, you know, when you do things for other people selflessly, and you're doing it without an agenda, without expecting anything in return, it seems like during those times is when good things actually start to happen for you and in your circle. Without you expecting it, things start to happen better for you. Or maybe you just start to come up with a different perspective and you come up with, with better ideas and how you're gonna you know, get through. So I think that you need to be focused on how to look out for others, man. There's gonna be a lot of people really struggling through these times. And if you're one of those people that's a little more fortunate than others, you gotta be thinking about ways to help others. You gotta be doing it, man. This is, this is gonna be bad for a lot of people. You know, the, they're talked about the unemployment numbers maybe going above 20%. I think that's a good start. I think it's going to go higher than that. But um, anyway, God bless you all out there right now. Uh, whenever I do these videos, I try to think, it of, think of it as uh, I'm not talking to a bunch of people. I'm talking to really just you, just one person. And so what, whoever you are and whatever you're going through right now, God bless you and uh, God be with you and you're going to be all right you're going to make it but you've got to be strong you have to keep things in perspective you've got to you know have the space to think about what you're going to do you know you've got you've got to you've got to take action you've got to get up and uh, carry on to get through this so anyway send me a message please comment below let me know what you're seeing let me know what you're going through and uh, just keep grinding, keep loving, you know, keep, keep from a place of, of love in everything that you do. Try not to have fear. Fear is not from God, you know, quite frankly. Fear is something that uh, paralyzed me for too many years, and there's nothing good that ever comes through it. Uh, you know, so whenever you have fear, in my opinion, you face it head on, you deal with it, and you conquer it. So anyway, God bless you. I love you guys. Carry on.